Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. I'm delighted to see so many of you have chosen to spend your Thursday evening with us. I can tell you've made a very wise decision. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome you here on behalf of the How To Academy for what I know is going to be a real treat of an evening. Quite frankly, how can it not be? Um, we've got the most compelling and timeless of subject matters, although, um, Emma, I'll let them decide just how timeless as the evening goes on. Um, a dazzling array of actors and, of course, the most able of Shakespeare guides, Emma Smith, who's been called a star in her generation of Shakespeare scholars. Um, and it's really not very hard to see why. I'm sure most of you know that the inspiration for this evening is her latest brilliant book, This Is Shakespeare, which, um, and as I hope we will do this evening, offers a really refreshing, new, and also very real and accessible, um, and often great fun perspective on the playwright. If you've come with your sort of notepads hoping to go away um, with concrete answers about what Shakespeare meant or intended, um, then I think you've probably come to the wrong place. But I can assure you, you haven't. Um, it's really, and as we shall hear, the ambiguities, the fact that it's a, more about questions than answers that makes it all the more exciting. Um, and also, as I'm sure you will hear, it's really you, the audience, and the reader who brings Shakespeare to life. But we are very lucky to have some help from, as I say, an extraordinary cast of actors. If I started to try and list all of the things they've done, then we would be here all evening. But just to introduce and, and to welcome Michael Pennington, Jonathan Thorbes, and Natasha McKellen. <laughs> I'm actually just going to hand over to Emma and to all of them, really, for the next half an hour or so. Um, then there'll be time, I think, for us to have a bit of a discussion, and then we'll hand over to you for some questions at the end. So thank you once again for coming, and over to you, Emma. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks uh, so much for being here. This is the first event since the publication of This is Shakespeare uh, a week ago today. Uh, so it's a real thrill for me, and I'm so delighted that you're here uh, to share it with me. And I'm also uh, really fortunate to have these great actors. Uh, I'm d delighted that they're all here, but I did want to pick out Michael Pennington in, in particular, who may uh, in some small way be the reason I'm here at all. I saw Michael Pennington's Richard II and Henry IV, Henry V uh, touring in Leeds uh, was I, when I was growing up in the 1980s. Uh, they were a brilliant, refreshing, abrasive uh, version of Shakespeare's history plays. Uh, in fact, after Henry V, one reviewer wrote, notably, this was the first production I've ever seen where you wanted the French to win. <laughs> And that gives a sense of the kind of the complete upturning of some pieties uh, about Shakespeare, uh, that as I was thinking about uh, the, the journey that's uh, taken me uh, to this point, I, I felt that was probably uh, a, a very particular turn in the road. So it's an enormous honor, Michael, to have you here. As, uh, as Hannah says, uh, we're not going to talk this evening about what Shakespeare meant. But what I hope that this uh, evening will do is to liberate us all and remind us uh, that it's okay to be liberated from that burden uh, of trying to crack Shakespeare or decipher it uh, or get the right answer. There are lots of um, inhibitions I think we have about enjoying Shakespeare, possibly because lots of us encounter him uh, first at school when we have to answer questions with right answers uh, about his works. And what I'm suggesting instead in my book is that there is never, there has never been a single right answer, that Shakespeare's plays are hardwired with questions and with ambiguities uh, and with gaps. And it's these gaps uh, that give us space uh, to be part of Shakespeare, but they're also these gaps which have uh, enabled Shakespeare to be reinterpreted uh, in such lively and important ways over the 400 years since the works were first performed. So I want to encourage you to think of uh, that, the, the, that Shakespeare is not so much a noun referring to a long dead playwright or a, a sort of canonical uh, monument or a cultural gatekeeper or something, but instead uh, to think about Shakespeare as a verb. And I want to suggest that to Shakespeare uh, is what we're doing this evening. This, we're all, we're all Shakespearing. Um, and I'm trying to think of Shakespeare as a verb which is all about our encounter. Uh, it's all about the meeting uh, of us and our lives and our interests with these works. 
Uh, and Shakespeare is a verb, I think, which means to question, to unsettle, to open out endings. Uh, and I want to try and persuade you that I think that's absolutely um, central to these works. It's not something that I am uh, bringing to them. It's something that was understood about them uh, by their earliest audiences and has continued uh, to be enjoyed about them ever since. Shakespeare, I want to suggest, is exactly the kind of non-binary thinker and artist we need in these most binary of times. And that's because his plays are all about the grey areas uh, between certainties. Uh, and they encourage us uh, to challenge and to rethink uh, things that we might feel we're sure about. So it's this kind of, uh, this sense of openness uh, that in my book I call gappiness. Um, uh, and I wanted gappiness uh, as, a, as a word uh, rather than Almost all the reviewers have wanted to have negative capability, which seems a very, um, a ve a, a very sort of dusty kind of concept uh, to me. I wanted gappiness. Uh, it's a more cheerful word. Uh, it's a more permissive uh, quality. Uh, and it suggests that these are uh, positive gaps. They are positive places uh, for us to, to intervene. So I'm going to structure what I say this evening around four particular kinds of gaps and we'll be able to use the talents of our actors uh, to understand a bit more uh, about that. So, the first play and the first kind of gap I want to talk about uh, is actually an ending, or an ending of sorts. In Taming of the Shrew, Shakespeare's early difficult comedy about the battle between the sexes, everything is up for grabs. It's actually really hard to give a synopsis of this play because every single thing uh, about it uh, requires some kind of interpretation before we can even start, start to talk. So, for example, uh, we have uh, Kate, who is, uh, depending how you look at it, a kind of feisty woman who knows her own mind and is resistant to patriarchal uh, uh, organizations around who she should marry, or is a kind of psychopath uh, who, who, who br breaks a musical instrument on her poor sister's head uh, and is, in fact, in completely incapable uh, of operating as part of society. Uh, she encounters Petruchio, who, depending how you look at it, is uh, a kind of bounty hunter come to wealth it to wealth it to no come to wive it wealthily uh, the wrong way around come to wive it wealthily in Padua. He's absolutely upfront that what he's come is to find a wealthy wife, uh, and he doesn't really mind what she's like so long as she's got money. Uh, so on the one hand, you know, he's, a, uh, he's an unpromising suitor, rather unromantic suitor, but on the other hand, there are ways in which he seems to meet Kate uh, and uh, match her uh, blow for blow, uh, joke for joke. Uh, perhaps he is precisely the kind of unconventional uh, man that she needs. Uh, uh, they're in this broader context, which is hard to interpret too, Bianca, uh, Kate's sister, uh, who uh, has to be, uh, is, has all these suitors around her. She's a kind of honeypot uh, figure. And she may either be the ideal woman that Kate fails to be, uh, or she is a kind of insipid sort of arm candy of a, of a, of a girl who you, you sort of probably would want to break a musical instrument uh, over, over her head, perhaps. Uh, and Baptista, who is Kate's uh, father, uh, is he a kind of worried widower? We get a lot of these figures in Shakespeare. Uh, we see it in a tragic version in King Lear. Is he sort of trying to make the best uh, of a difficult situation and manage these daughters? Uh, should we feel sorry for him? Or is he an absolute symbol of... Uh, patriarchy marrying off his daughter without any kind of uh, sense that she might have a say in it. Even, in fact, the name Kate turns out to be a site of conflict. You'd think that might be one thing we could agree on. Um, but when Petruchio meets Kate for the first time, he greets her, "'Good morrow, Kate, for that's your name, I hear.' And she immediately says, "'Well, have you heard, but something hard of hearing. They call me Catherine.' that do talk of me. So even the name that we give the central character, perhaps we should rethink. Uh, and it's hard to know again, you know, is Petruchio, uh, you may have a strong view on this if you've got a name that can be abbreviated. Uh, you might have quite a strong sense of who's allowed to do that and who isn't. So does the fact that Petruchio continues to call Catherine Kate, is that a kind of lovable um, uh, kind of uh, domestic detail about this private relationship? Or is it 
what we would now call a kind of microaggression. <laughs> so <clears throat> there are lots and lots of questions about the play, uh, and uh, they come together uh, in this wonderful, perplexing speech uh, that Natasha is going to give for us at the end. Uh, uh, Kate, Kate Catherine has been off stage uh, for quite a long time, uh, but she comes back uh, at Petruchio's request or demand uh, to deliver this long speech about wifely submission. And Natasha, I think, is going to um, deliver that with uh, Jonathan as her Petruchio at the end. Fie, fie, unknit that threatening, unkind brow, and dart not scornful glances from those eyes to wound thy lord, thy king, thy governor. It blots the beauty as frosts do bite the meads, confounds thy fame as whirlwinds shake fair buds, and in no sense is meet or amiable. A woman moved is like a fountain troubled, muddy, ill-seeming, thick, bereft of beauty. And while it is so, none so dry or thirsty will deign to sip at it. Thy husband is thy lord, thy life, thy keeper, thy head, thy sovereign, one that cares for thee and for thy maintenance commits his body to painful labour, both by sea and land, to watch the night in storms, the day in cold, whilst thou liest warm at home, secure and safe, and craves no other tribute at thy hands but love, fair looks, and true obedience. Too little payment for so great a debt. Such duty as the subject owes the prince, even such a woman oweth to her husband. And when she is forward, peevish, sullen, sour, and not obedient to his honest will, what is she but a foul contending rebel and a graceless traitor to her loving lord? I am ashamed that women are so simple to offer war where they should kneel for peace, or seek for rule, supremacy, and sway when they are bound to serve, love, and obey. Why are our bodies soft and weak and smooth, unapt to toil and trouble in the world, but that our soft conditions and our hearts should well agree with our external parts? Come, come, you fraud and unable worms, my mind hath been as big as one of yours, my heart is great, my reason haply more, to bandy word for word and frown for frown, but now I see our lances are but straws, our strength is weak, our weakness past compare, that seeming to be most which we indeed least are. Then veil your stomachs, for it is no boot, and place your hands below your husband's foot, in a token of which duty, if he please, my hand is ready. May it do him ease. Why, there's a wench. Come on and kiss me, Kate. <laughs> so that most... <clears throat> Fam famous line, perhaps from the play, uh, taken up uh, for the musical. Uh, perhaps you see that uh, one of the things it also does at this moment is to prove he still hasn't got her name. Um, <laughs> it's really interesting what, what you were drawn to do at the end, end of that, um, at that speech. There are lots of uh, different kind of ambiguities and things being mobilized now. I'll just try and touch on uh, a couple of them because what I'm going to actually ask, uh, we've got s such a, an opportunity that I'm going to ask Natasha to do it again differently to show uh, how those things can come, can come forward. But there's so many ambiguities in that. For one thing, it's such a long speech, uh, particularly for a comedy which tends to be all about dialogue and things moving. This is much the longest speech uh, in the play uh, and Catherine uh, de delivers it sort of 
as a set piece, nobody sort of encourages her to do it particularly. So there are lots of questions for actors, uh, for the other actors on stage. What are they doing? Are they listening to her? Uh, does this work as a, as a sort of set piece of um, uh, wifely uh, wisdom? Uh, it's got quite a lot of rhyme in it, and sometimes Shakespeare uses rhyme uh, to make things seem a bit, a bit pat or a bit sing-song or perhaps a little bit uh, inadequate. Maybe that's something uh, that's going on there. Uh, it, are we meant to take this seriously? Does she mean, does she mean it seriously when she calls us worms? Uh, are we meant to feel uh, that we are worms or that that's a little bit uh, excessive? Uh, and when she offers to put her hand under her husband's foot, uh, it, it, it's a very different stage gesture uh, if she does uh, lower herself or abase herself or submit uh, in some physical way, uh, and then Petruchio's response is also interesting. There's no stage direction in the text, early text of this play uh, that tells us what happens uh, at this point. So when Petruchio says, uh, there's a wench, come on and kiss me, Kate, uh, there's, there's nothing, there's a gap. Uh, and that's a gap which we can fill depending on uh, how we feel about the rest of the play, depending on how we feel perhaps about what kind of an ending a comedy ought to have. We can fill it in lots of different ways. Um, we can fill it with uh, an idea that the couple have finally got together, uh, that they've finally broken down their kind of um, uh, re resistance and their inability to admit to each other uh, that they're actually pretty well matched. You could see it as a complete defeat uh, of Catherine. Uh, you could see her actually saying, no, I won't, I won't kiss you. Uh, I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a possibility that she, that she rejects that. So all of those different possibilities, and many more, I think, are, uh, are given in that speech. It's a speech which doesn't feel to me that it answers the questions of the play. In fact, it ends the play uh, by sort of reopening them all again. The big, biggest question being, is Catherine really tamed? Uh, and what would that taming mean? So, Natasha, I'm going to ask you if you'll just have another go at it. Oh, here this time. I'll see you better. <laughs> fie, fie, unknit that threatening, unkind brow and dart not scornful glances from those eyes to wound thy lord, thy king, thy governor. It blots thy beauty as frosts do bite the meads, confounds thy fame as whirlwinds shake fair buds, and in no sense is meet or amiable. A woman moved is like a fountain troubled, muddy, ill-seeming, thick, bereft of beauty. <laughs> and while it is so, none so dry or thirsty will deign to sip or touch one drop of it. Mm. Thy husband is thy lord, thy life, thy keeper, thy head, thy sovereign. One that cares for thee and for thy maintenance commits his body to painful labour, both by sea and land, to watch the night in storms, the day in cold, whilst thou liest warm at home, secure and safe, and craves no other tribute at thy hands but love, fair looks, and true obedience. Too little payment for so great a debt. Such duty as the subject owes the prince, even such a woman oweth to her husband. And when she is forward, peevish, sullen, sour, and not obedient to his honest will, what is she but a foul contending rebel and graceless traitor to her loving lord? I am ashamed that women are so simple to offer war where they should kneel for peace, or seek for rule, supremacy, and sway when they are bound to serve, love, and obey. Why our bodies are soft and weak and smooth, unapt to toil and trouble in the world, but that our soft conditions and our hearts should well agree with our external parts? Come, come, you fraud and unable worms. My mind hath been as big as one of yours, my heart as great, my reason haply more, to bandy word for word and frown for frown. But now I see our lances are but straws, our strength as weak, our weakness past compare, that seeming to be most which we indeed least are. Then veil your stomachs, 
for it is no boot, and place your hands below your husband's foot, in token of which duty, if he please, my hand is ready, may it do him ease. Why, there's a wench. <laughs> Come on and kiss me, Kate. <laughs> That's a really brilliant way to use the length of the speech is to suggest who, I mean, who writes this stuff, which is kind of what you're looking at and saying, it says here, worms, you know, who, who, who does this stuff? But how did, how did those two versions feel to you? Which, is one easier? Is one, does one feel more natural with the speech as it's written? I think, you know, once you've learned it and imbibed it, you, you kind of believe it more anyway than, mm. than reading. So I think the, the reading limits the scope, obviously. But I think playing her in earnest is what is meant. I think sort of trying to twist it and make it ironic and sort of raised eyebrow and, yeah, like, like a device. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Mm. Hmm. It's, really, yeah. it. it's really interesting. There's a, there's a, um, a uh, sequel play to Taming of the Shrew written by uh, one of Shakespeare's fellow playwrights, a, a playwright he, he collaborates with, in fact, John Fletcher, who writes a play called The Woman's Prize or The Tamer Tamed. Uh, and he takes up the characters. It's a piece of fan fiction, effectively. He takes up the characters of Taming of the Shrew and writes a new play about them and a, and a very much more feminist and kind of woke uh, play than Shakespeare uh, ever wrote. And the, the situation in The Tamer Tamed is that uh, Petruchio has been widowed, Catherine has died. He's about to under undertake uh, his second marriage to Maria, and his friends are all saying to him, thank God you've got a quiet one this time. <laughs> so the men in Tamer Tamed, thinking back to the, the events of uh, Shakespeare's play, seem to feel that Petruchio married an absolute shrew. On the other hand, the women in that play, the women characters, uh, uh, Maria, who's uh, going to be Petruchio's second wife, uh, seems a very meek and amenable figure. And of course, you can imagine that as soon as they're married, uh, she uh, sets up a, a sort of barricade in her bedchamber, and it, she and her girlfriends are throwing things down at the bridegroom and saying, uh, and she says to him, you have been known as a wife breaker. Well, this time you've got a wife who's going to break you. So one of the things that's really interesting to me about that is it shows us an immediate response, an almost immediate response to Shakespeare's play within a, within a few years, in which uh, some characters in the play remember the taming of the shrew as if Catherine had been uh, tamed and broken by Petruchio, but others actually remember uh, a, a much more resistant kind of Catherine and a sense that Petruchio has been led a, a kind of merry dance in his first uh, marriage. And that's a piece of evidence which makes me think that actually the ambiguity about what's happened at the end and how we take the ending uh, was, always, uh, was always there and was always recognisable. So uh, that, that was completely, a completely wonderful um, uh, example, I think, of, where, uh, of, a, of a couple of different kinds of gaps uh, that I want to draw attention to when we think about Shakespeare. Uh, one, is a, one is formal or generic. It's about the gaps that there always are when we read a play script uh, which doesn't have narration, doesn't have description, just has the dialogue of the characters. Uh, and uh, when actors pick up those scripts, they can um, embody them in all kinds of different ways, as, as we saw uh, a taste of there. But we can also see some kind of um, uh, ideological gaps, if you like, some, some gaps maybe between uh, uh, different kinds of reading, uh, a more conservative reading, a more radical reading, they're uh, sort of open uh, there. So that, that's the kind of gaps I wanted to get from uh, Taming of the Shrew, and I'm going to move on. Uh, to a second uh, example then. Um, this is a kind of gap which was particularly operative for Shakespeare's own period, but I think it's one of the things that's made his work uh, particularly applicable to later periods too. When Shakespeare is writing, uh, his, his society is experiencing a really profound transition uh, between different ways of seeing the world. And broadly, the waning, the older way of seeing the world uh, is, is of a world uh, organized by providence or by God. 
Uh, it's a world in which, if you were to ask a question, why did this happen, the answer would always be the same. It happened because God wanted it to happen. So that's the waning version. The waxing version, the version that's, that's coming up, uh, is a much more human-centered uh, view of agency. Uh, if you were to ask in that world, why do things happen, you might say a powerful individual acted in these particular ways. It's the kind of uh, vision of the world that gives us great man or great person uh, history. And in the 16th century, it's associated with the Italian statesman and writer Machiavelli. And Machiavelli uh, is, is absolutely radical in saying, um, actually, you know, um, God doesn't seem to look after good rulers at all. And the people who are successful, if you look back at history, are people who are wily and canny and use their power uh, uh, successfully. And maybe, maybe God's not so involved in uh, human affairs after all. Maybe we make our own uh, luck. This sense of having a foot in both camps, I think, is, uh, is, is one of Shakespeare's abiding modes, and it's, it's, it gives him a kind of balance uh, between different uh, worldviews, which I think is very rarely uh, reconciled uh, in his plays. So we could see in Othello that the title character uh, adheres to an older view of the world, uh, Othello is, is, a, is, a, is a person of kind of providence or of faith. And we can see that Iago is absolutely a new man who says, we make our own fates, we make our own luck. We can see something similar happens between uh, the bad brother, um, the good brother Edgar and the bad brother Edmund in King Lear. They too are kind of either side of this uh, way of seeing the world. And you'll begin to see that it's bad characters for Shakespeare who have a huge amount of dramatic energy and amoral kind of energy who tend to be associated with this human-centered uh, view uh, of agency. Um, and one more example might be Richard III. Richard III, uh, Richard is, is so successful in his play um, because sort of everyone else, no one else seems to have got the memo that says, you know, providence is over, guys. You know, you make, make your own fortune, take a hold of it, take hold of it by the scruff of the neck, and that's what Richard uh, absolutely does. So <clears throat> this question of agency, the question of why things happen, uh, and the question of what makes the things happen in Shakespeare, is very often uh, a question that we ask about the plays, perhaps in the expectation that we'll be able to answer it. And what I want to suggest instead is uh, that's precisely the questions the play, uh, plays want, to, want you to ask, uh, but they're not going to give you the answers. Uh, and the question of agency I want to explore uh, for a minute uh, in uh, Macbeth. So <clears throat> um, the question of who's to blame uh, in Macbeth uh, is, is one that the play begins with. Um, if, if, you, if you remember it, you might recall that it starts with thunder and lightning and the three witches. When shall we three meet again in thunder, lightning, or in rain? So it's, it's shaped by these supernatural forces, but it's unclear whether the witches uh, know what's going to happen or make things happen, so their powers are also up for, up for grabs a bit. Uh, we've got a, a Macbeth who is very... Um, uh, t takes control of a situation uh, and is characterized from the outset by extreme bloodthirstiness and extreme savagery. Uh, that's before we hear uh, anything else about him. And then, of course, we've got Lady Macbeth, who has been uh, one of the absolute go-to tropes for people who think that uh, w women in power uh, must be uh, sort of monstrous and transgressive in some way, uh, and that to have um, a, a wife who, in sort of Rebecca West's ter terms, is not a doormat, is to be married to a Lady Macbeth who is making you do all kinds of things that you probably don't want to. And we can see that this has been a real question about Macbeth. It's the most commonly used play to teach law students how to debate, um, uh, how to make cases, uh, and the most common uh, ways of getting Macbeth off the charge uh, of murder uh, now, you might, be, might not be surprised to know, are on the one hand, PTSD, the, the, the trauma of being a, a military, uh, military soldier, but the other, a kind of nagging wife, uh, syndrome. So there are questions about uh, motivation and questions about agency uh, which hang around Macbeth, and I want us to look at those uh, for a few minutes. Um, 
and Michael and Natasha are going to read two, two segments of the encounter between the Macbeths. And I wanted to show you this. It's Shakespeare's only real portrait of a marriage, and it's a really, uh, two really interesting pieces of writing. Great glance, worthy <laughs> corridor, greater than both by all hail hereafter. Thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present, and I feel now the future in the instant. My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight. And when goes hence? Mm. Tomorrow, as he purposes. Oh, never shall son that morrow see. Your face, my thane is as a book where men may read strange matters. To beguile the time, look like the time. Bear welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. He that's coming must be provided for, and you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch, which shall, to all our nights and days to come, give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. We will speak further. Only look up clear. To alter favour ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. He has almost supped. Why have you left the chamber? Have you asked for me? No, you not, he has. We will proceed no further in this business. He hath honoured me of late, and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? Hath it slept since, and wakes it now, so to look so green and pale at what it did so freely? From this time, such I account thy love. Art thou afeard to be the same in thine own act and valour as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteemst thee ornament of life, and live a coward in thine own esteem, letting I dare not wait upon I would, like the poor yeah. cat of the adage. Prithee, peace. I dare do all that may become a man, who dares do more is none. What beast was then that made you break this enterprise to me, when you durst do it? Then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves, and that their fitness now does unmake you. I have given suck, and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. I would, while it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out, had I so sworn as you have done to this. If we should fail. We fail. But screw your courage to the sticking place and we'll not fail. When Duncan is asleep, where to the rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite him, his two chamberlains will I with wine and wassail so convince that memory, the warder of the brain, shall be a fume, and the receipt of reason, a limbeck only, when in swinish sleep their drenched natures lie as in a death. What cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan, what not put upon his spongy officers, who shall bear the guilt of our great quell? Bring forth men, children only. For thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. <laughs> Will it not be received when we have smeared with blood those sleeping two of his own chamber and used their very daggers that they have done it? Who doth receive it other? Michael, do you, do you think you want to kill Duncan? Do you think we ought to? You, do you, yourself? Uh, no. I mean, she's, she's completely in control of him. 
And she plays various roles to get into his, his, his vulnerabilities or to touch the nerve in him that wants it. This is a man who actually commits murder for a living anyway, mm -hmm. as a military man. Mm -hmm. But he has great difficulty in resolving and afterwards recovering from, in the long term, the one, one killing he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, yes, he's drawn to power. He says it right at the beginning when he meets the witches. Mm -hmm. You know, they've, they've talked about it before, he's thought about it before, mm. but he's trying to you know, um, keep some semblance of mm. humanity mm. when he comes back to it. Yeah, that's really interesting. We can, he's no I, match for her. Yeah, we, we, can, we can hear it, I think, in what you're saying there, some of the push and pull, which are partly, it's partly characterological, it's partly about Macbeth as a, as a, as a, um, a, a dramatic personage uh, being drawn in one direction or another, but it's also partly structural uh, in the play itself. The play has given us some different reasons uh, t to turn Macbeth into a murderer. It's already told us about his uh, ferocity in battle, for instance. It's already uh, had him uh, withdrawn and self-absorbed when he's heard the, um, uh, the, the witch's prophecy. Uh, so there are, there are different things uh, going on here uh, that I think um, uh, the play can't quite reconcile. Uh, a, different, a, a performance can cut through, can make a decision. Uh, there are ways in which uh, a dramatic performance can't live in this um, both-and uh, situation about Shakespeare that I'm trying to encourage you to be in. It has to make a decision. Um, but the, the, one of the great liberations about reading and about thinking with Shakespeare is we can, we can believe or, or maintain uh, contradictory things, the contradictions uh, of the play uh, itself. One of the great uh, interventions into this question of uh, motive and causation in Macbeth, uh, for me, is um, a work by, a short story by James Thurber, the American humor humorist, called The Macbeth Murder Mystery, uh, which has a, a detective, a woman who loves detective stories, uh, thrown on uh, Macbeth uh, as reading matter uh, when she's run out of uh, stories. And then the next morning, her host says, what did you think of it? And she says, well, it was quite good. I mean, clearly he didn't do it. Um, it's a very, very in interesting take on these questions of uh, <coughs> motivation, uh, the question of, of uh, internal motivation, uh, motivation and persuasion by other human beings, and also this cosmic frame uh, that Macbeth uh, suggests. Uh, that speaks to a question about causation that I've already suggested was historical to Shakespeare, but it's also one that's very current with us, with us now. Um, you know, people who believe in fate or believe in uh, human beings' uh, ability to to, uh, uh, to to control control events. So I think if we try to answer the question about motivation and causation in Macbeth, we do a bit of damage to the kind of gaps which seem to me uh, important to that play. The last couple of examples I want to give us are ways in which um, perhaps a tradition of over-narrow interpretation of Shakespeare has closed down certain possibilities before we even really uh, register that they are present. Uh, a kind of narrow thinking about Shakespeare which limits our capacity to interpret and which closes up or ignores the gappiness, or fills it up with convention. Um, one of the plays I want to talk about here is A Midsummer Night's Dream, which for all kinds of uh, linguistic and other reasons, uh, is very often the play to which children are first uh, introduced if they're going to learn about Shakespeare. And I've been in some wonderful uh, primary school classrooms where they've been uh, f fairies and, and, uh, and, and dancing around in various ways. So nothing I say is, is, is against um, uh, the good and the importance of uh, children uh, enjoying Shakespeare. But what that nursery view of uh, Midsummer Night's Dream has closed down for us uh, is access to a much more adult and a much more X-rated play. Uh, Puck, Robin Goodfellow, uh, is a figure we tend to see on the modern stage as a kind of athletic uh, person, usually with a bare chest and green tights, uh, capering about, uh, being a, a sort of mischievous but essentially uh, benign uh, figure. Uh, if you had looked at a, a visual representation of Robin Goodfellow uh, in the Shakespearean period, you would have come across a rather alarming woodcut illustration uh, of a, a sturdy gentleman with hooved, uh, cloven hooves, uh, 
uh, and a uh, very shaggy, uh, hairy body, and I'm afraid to say, a huge phallus. <laughs> so Robin Goodfellow was a sexual symbol, was a symbol of sexual energy and anarchic energy, uh, the kind of night work, the kind of dream work uh, that would have been immediately uh, associated with the play was much less decorous and much less fairy-like, I think, uh, than, than our more modern uh, interpretations uh, have given us. Um, and there, is, oh, there are two examples, uh, one of which Jonathan uh, is going to uh, read for us. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to touch on uh, uh, the, a, a way of thinking about Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, which is as a much more uh, sexual, a much more disturbingly sexual uh, play. We've tended to think of Shakespeare's comedies as, as being about courtship and perhaps about foreplay, but about leaving sex very much uh, outside uh, the confines of the play. Um, but we have a, a, a story here where Theseus has taken his wife uh, to be Hippolyta, the Amazon queen, prisoner. Uh, I wooed thee with my sword, he says, which is a, a disturbing opening image. And the rest of the play is all about filling up the time uh, before Theseus uh, can consummate his marriage to Hippolyta. There's an air of sexual violence, actually, about the play uh, right, from the, right from the start. Uh, against that, we've got this extraordinary uh, satire or parody on romantic love, uh, that the convention of love at first sight uh, is really um, made uh, foolish and laughable here. Um, uh, uh, Robin Goodfellow has uh, this uh, plant extract uh, that he's going to anoint people's eyes with and they will fall in love with the first person they see. It's a way of joking about how romantic comedy works that suddenly, da -da, you know, in a minute, uh, you're, you're in love. One of the things I think... Uh, uh, Shakespeare has in his sights in Midsummer Night's Dream is Romeo and Juliet and how preposterous in certain ways it is, how a comedy might make, might bring out what's, what's really silly uh, about Romeo and Juliet. Uh, th these romantic couples are completely interchangeable. In fact, um, uh, th there's, there's one, there's what, well, there are probably many mistakes in my book, but there is one mistake in my book where in trying to say how interchangeable all the lovers are, I completely mix them up inadvertently, um, but I have sort of um, uh, managed my own, my own point, perhaps. Uh, Helena, no, Hermia says uh, she, she won't uh, marry uh, the man her father wants her to marry, but nobody in the play tries to differentiate them. They seem completely interchangeable to everyone. Uh, there's no sense that these lovers are uh, distinct and, and you know, made for each other. There's just this kind of melee of swapping uh, and interchangeability. <clears throat> and then finally, we have a great scene between Titania, the fairy queen, and Bottom, uh, the uh, mechanical, the weaver, uh, who has been transformed with an ass's head. This is all a trick by Oberon uh, to facilitate the transfer of a changeling boy, uh, a character we never see on stage, uh, but who is clearly a, 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 um, a figure of a, of a kind of erotic desire or a, a kind of overinvestment by Titania and Oberon in a way that the unseen changeling boy prefigures that boy-girl uh, figure who's attractive to both sexes, uh, on whom the later comedies like As You Like It uh, and Twelfth Night are going to major. Uh, in order to humiliate Titania, to give up this changeling boy, uh, she's, uh, she's made to um, uh, encounter, uh, let's say, Bottom uh, with his <coughs> uh, ass's head. And this scene uh, was an absolute favourite of Victorian nursery illustrations, and you will see hundreds and hundreds of uh, decorous, uh, gracious Titanias stroking Bottom's ears uh, and uh, putting flowers all around him. Um, I think that is a slightly vanilla version of probably <laughs> what needs to happen in this scene in order that Titania can be so ashamed that she does exactly what Oberon uh, wants with the changeling boy. But maybe let's look at it from Bottom's point of view, and Jonathan's going to give us a Bottom speech when he is recalling what's happened. My cue comes, call me, and I will answer. Uh, my next is most fear, Pyramus. Hey ho. Peter Quint. Flute the bellows, Mender. Snout the tinker. Starvelin. God's my life. St 
stole the lens and left me asleep. I have had a most rare vision. I have had a dream. Past the wit of man to say what dream it was. Man is but an ass if you go about to expound this dream. <sighs> me thought I was... <laughs> There is no man can tell what. Me thought I had. Me thought I was. <laughs> a man is but a patch fool if he will offer to say what me thought I had. The eye of man hath not heard. The ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand is not able to taste. His tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. I will get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream. It shall be called... Bottoms dream <laughs> because it had no bottom and I will sing it in the latter end of a play before the duke peradventure to make it the more gracious I shall sing it at her death what was brilliant about that speech and the way Jonathan did it was that the thing's bottom keeps coming towards and not quite saying are the very gaps of the sort of unspeakable sexuality of all different uh, and, and rather um, permissive kinds that I think this play uh, so enjoys. Uh, so um, uh, maybe not so suitable after all for children or not, not only suitable for children. Uh, I've got one last example <coughs> where uh, perhaps we have... Um, uh, gone along with a, a rather restricted view uh, of Shakespeare, uh, which maybe has closed out some other interpretations. And I want to use that example uh, to talk just in the last couple of minutes about uh, biography uh, and uh, authorial intention as a more general framing uh, for what I've been talking about. Um, <clears throat> I asked uh, Michael if he would read the last, uh, the epilogue uh, to uh, The Tempest when Prospero uh, asks to be uh, set free. But in fact, he said there was another speech that he would rather read, uh, and I was d d delighted about that. So I'm going to ask him to read it, and then I'm probably going to put him on the spot about why he wanted to read that one. <clears throat> you elves of hills, brooks, standing lakes and groves, and you that on the sands with printless foot do chase the ebbing Neptune and do fly him when he comes back. You demi-puppets that by moonshine do the green sour ringlets make whereof the you not bites, and you whose pastime is to make midnight mushrooms that rejoice to hear the solemn curfew, by whose aid, weak masters though ye be, I have bedimmed the noontide sun, call forth the mutinous winds, and twixt the green sea and the azure vault set roaring war. To the dread rattling thunder have I given fire and rifted Jove's stout oak with his own bolt, the strong-based promontory have I made shake, and by the spurs plucked up the pine and cedar. Graves at my command have waked their sleepers, oped and let them forth by my so potent art. But this rough magic I hear abjure. And when I've required some heavenly music, which even now I do, to work mine end upon their senses that this airy charm is for, I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than it ever plummet sound, I'll drown my book. I, 
I can see it seems a sort of silly Mrs. Merton-ish question to say, why, why did you choose, why did, it was so wonderful, it, perhaps it's evident why you chose it, but wh why was that the speech from the play that you wanted? Well, it's a show off, isn't it, really? Uh, <laughs> it's true, I mean, there's so many, in the great swill that is The Tempest, there's so many conflicting, semi-conflict, and there's so many storylines, there's so many themes, aren't there? I mean, starting with, why is it first in the folio, as you very... <laughs> Um, adeptly pointed out on the radio this week. And th th there's sort of mystery about the ending because all the time we're thinking, is this to do with Shakespeare saying goodbye to us? Is it to do with Prospero saying goodbye to Caliban and going back to Milan? It has a store, that context in, in the play, but at the same time there's a strong overtone that this may be the last we're going to hear from the great playwright. Um, I personally think that at the end... Um, when essentially he says, I'm going back to Naples now, so please give me a round of applause. It seems to be rather unresolved whether he's talking about himself as a performer or whether he's Shakespeare himself as a performer or whether he's um, finishing Prospero's story. He seems to be trying to combine the two. And I suppose I think that the imagery of this is so much more potent and so much more felt and so much more passionate. And on the one hand, boastful, but on the other hand, accepting his limitations. It has the full-bodied nature, like a really good red wine, <laughs> um, that, that Shakespeare's capable of in what was perhaps the last thing that he wrote for the stage. And what emerges from it really is, this is him. This is him saying, I can do all these things. I can make the mountains move. I can do all those things, the outlines in the speech. And I think you are supposed to think that that Shakespeare telling us he's always done all those things, but only with words. Hmm. And that's his claim to fame, glory, and posterity. Hmm. Thank you. That, that's <laughs> wonderful. That's exactly what I argue against uh, in the last <laughs> chapter of my book. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> But, but, I, but I feel that was so beautifully put that perhaps I, <laughs> perhaps I, perhaps I, won't, uh, perhaps I won't do anything with that. <clears throat> well, I don't know. It's, it's absolutely fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> uh, never work with children or animals or actors, in fact. <clears throat> no. <clears throat> So, so, so it's absolutely true that one of the really compelling interpretations of The Tempest is, is, is essentially biographical. Uh, and, and I wanted to end with um, uh, just, just a, a, a slightly longer um, thought about biography as a, as a method for thinking uh, about Shakespeare. Um, it, in lots of ways, I think we are uh, enormously keen, eager to find um, Bi biography uh, underpinning Shakespeare's writing to give us a glimpse of what, what it might have been like to be the person who wrote these works, uh, but also perhaps to, to authenticate certain kinds of emotion uh, or to uh, give us a clearer sense of which of these many interpretations we ought to take seriously. That's to say, I think we use biography in a limiting way uh, as, a, 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 as a kind of defense against a multiplying kind of meaning that we could allow. We could allow these plays to mean more than one thing, and we could therefore free ourselves, perhaps, uh, of uh, bi biography. Biographical readings of, of Shakespeare's plays, like that idea that The Tempest is Shakespeare's farewell to the stage, uh, are very uh, much uh, 19th century uh, things. And one of their unintended consequences, uh, actually, is to produce a skepticism that Shakespeare actually wrote his own plays. So the biographical interpretation of Shakespeare and the so-called authorship controversy are absolutely twins um, because what happens when you rely on the Shakespeare's biography is it becomes more and more implausible somehow that this person could have written uh, these works. So there's the, the relation between the life uh, and the works, I think, is something that biographical criticism uh, really worries about. So... In This is Shakespeare, I try to suggest that really probably the only biography that matters is yours, uh, that the most interesting people uh, to think about at these plays are you, uh, and that only you know how you're going to do that. Um, it's been wonderful to hear uh, talented actors uh, read these plays, um, but what I want uh, really to convey to you at the end of this uh, part of the evening uh, is that you can do that. Uh, and you can do it in lots of different ways, uh, and that your Shakespeare 
uh, will be quite different from mine uh, and from uh, the other uh, speakers here uh, on the stage. So I want to finish my part by saying uh, I hope my book uh, can give back Shakespeare to you. I hope you'll disagree with things that I've said, maybe about uh, uh, Prospero uh, and Shakespeare, for instance. That's absolutely great. Um, what I've tried to model in the book uh, is a sense of permissiveness and of openness uh, and a sense that it's uh, that what, what's really, really important about Shakespeare, and this is my final point, I think, what's really important about Shakespeare is not its origin, it is its reception. And that's you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma, and thank you all for your wonderful performances. Um, we've just got about 10 minutes or so before I hand over to the audience. You talk, obviously, at the end there um, about biography, but do you also feel that intention, those are two different things, should we disregard his intention as well? Yes. yes. I'll say that for the tape. <laughs> say it for the tape, please. I do think we should disregard Shakespeare's intention just because I think it's completely irrecoverable. Uh, we, we, we just can't know, and so you're in a kind of double counting then that you deduce back from the plays, this must have been Shakespeare's intention, and then you say, Shakespeare's intention was this, and here it is in the play. So it, it, it's a closed system. The only place where I think uh, it, can be, it can be interesting to do that is... Um, if you look at Shakespeare's relation to his sources, uh, so Shakespeare um, is, like all writers of his time, uh, is <clears throat> making his plays out of previous literary works. This is a, this is an, a very recycling, up, upcycling kind of culture. Uh, what you do if you're a writer is you show what you've read uh, and you reuse it in, in interesting ways. And there are lots of ways uh, that Shakespeare does that. And there's just re one example in my book where I probably am talking a little bit about intention. Uh, in Cor Coriolanus, it's a really difficult, unlikable play with a really difficult, unlikable uh, central character. Um, Coriolanus gets his name from uh, an incredibly uh, brave, mad, um, savage uh, attack on Coriol, and he gets the name uh, Coriolanus as an honorific. And as he remembers the battle, he says, um, a poor man uh, helped me, you know, a, a citizen of Coriol helped me, uh, will you make sure that he's safe? Uh, and the people around him say, yeah, sh absolutely fine, what's his name? And Coriolanus says, I've forgotten. And that's the end. Um, now, there's lots of interesting things about that. It is in Shakespeare's source, but in the source, it's a rich man. And this is a play all about rich and poor and you know, class struggle and all of those things. So that looks like an intentional, uh, an intentional shift. But um, having seen that it's probably intentional, it's kind of hard to know what you do with that. So it's not, it's not for me, a very useful, a really useful critical tool, I don't think. Um, and just before, I would like to ask you whether you find the intention um, something you refer to when you're rehearsing. But can I just quickly come back to that in the sense that it doesn't feel in the book that you want to entirely remove it, though, from its context, in the, in the sense that some people have. You do ground quite a lot of the plays in their historical context. Is that, that's very important to you. Yeah, I, so I tried to understand uh, where the plays came from and what might have been important about them at the time. Um, and I suppose I try and do that to, uh, to give a sort of anchor point for thinking about all the things that have been done with them since. Um, so I don't think how the plays were done at the time has a particular um, priority. I don't think that's what we should be trying to find out. I don't think that's necessarily the most interesting things uh, a, a, about them. Um, but sometimes I try and say that what the plays were doing at the time might be a little bit less... Um, uh, m might be a little bit less conservative than the received idea about them. So I try and say that I think Shakespeare's history plays were all about political upheaval and uncertainty, and they had quite a kind of challenging politics, rather than, as some critics have seen, that they are all about uh, something called the Tudor myth, which is a way of bolstering Elizabeth's authority. So sometimes I try and use the historical context, I, I suppose, to, uh, to, to suggest things that may be a bit more open than, than we've thought. And from a perspective of, of, of acting Shakespeare, and this is open to any of you, when you're reading it, when you're rehearsing it, when you're practicing it, 
do you think it's helpful to try and think of what he intended, his, what his direct, because he gives very little stage directions, as you talk about, or very little character analysis. When you're preparing for a Shakespearean role, do you think about his intention? Um, not his grand intention, necessarily. Um, you don't necessarily seek to find out why he wrote this particular kind of play, such as Coriolanus in 1602 or whenever it was. You know, your main intention is, his main intention appears to be to make it believable that whatever this character that he's invented and created and set in motion, given life to, uh, says, is consistent with what that person is. In other words, that you believe whatever point of view he's making or he or she is making, that he, he or she would say that after that. I mean, the internal logic, which is basically a dramatic device, I think is what preoccupied him completely because he was such a... You know, he was a professional playwright who produced two plays a year for a very hungry company, and he had to deliver, had to deliver, and had to deliver. So he lived under that sort of pressure, and he had to produce things that were ready to go into rehearsal almost immediately. It just as a, a, a kind of note of interest, maybe, I regard Shakespeare as being one of the great unopinionated playwrights, in the sense that you never really find out what he thought about his subjects. You don't really know whether he thoroughly approves of Coriolanus or not, for example, as we're on Coriolanus. And together with, actually I think Sophocles is another example, Samuel Beckett is another, Chekhov above all perhaps, uh, playwrights, you never learn what they think, what is behind the plays in the sense of political opinions or opinions about relationships. It's, it's all fu funneled through these invented characters and they, he just leaves them like the members of a, an orchestra possibly a competing orchestra to, to battle things out themselves. Is that quite liberating as an actor? Yeah, I think it is, isn't it? I mean, for your... Well, I give, a tiny, <clears throat> I give a tiny example from recently yeah. rehearsing Hamlet, um, which was about the ghost and the ghost's appearances. And that this was, I mean, um, in very simple terms, it was based on a, on a more primitive com comedy where there was a ghost. And a lot of his references were to the newly built globe, as far as I was, as far as I learned from you know what I was reading in rehearsals. So there were re references to you hear this fellow in the cellarage. It was co sort of deliberately, self-consciously spooky or a ghost, and and that was very interesting to me in rehearsals to find out these, to have some some of that extra help. But when it comes to forming the character, what 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 I found, or I've always found enormously beneficial about Shakespeare is, uh, is, is the, um, you know, the accessibility of it and the fact that you, you don't necessarily have to come up with an arch reading. I, I don't enjoy it when actors build up irony. We talked about this mm. with Catherine and uh, Petruchio. When an, actor, when an actor comes up with a very arch reading, it can be distracting to the audience. You really want to find a way of, of interpreting the words in, in, a, in, a, in, in a responsive, in a, an enthusiastic and, and uh, instinctive way. Yeah, I, I guess for me, usually, I think context is everything. I mean, particularly where the news is concerned and, you know, headlines and quotes and things like that, or misquotes. But with, with Shakespeare, I mean, as an actor, I think with his writing, as you brilliantly point out in, in your book, the fact that he doesn't describe how someone looks or what they're wearing or where they're coming from or any of that sort of context liberates you to... I guess I just sort of see it that you're a conduit for his words. And if any time you get mannered or you try to start letting the audience understand what it is he's trying to say, you kind of get in the way of what he's trying to say. At least in my you know, experience, that, that's what's happened. And I love that you say that you know, the lovers in Midsummer Night's Dream are interchangeable, because I remember you know, there's two things that people always hang on with Helena and Hermia, is that you know, one is meant to be small and dark, and one is meant to be oh, tall and one? blonde. Oh, Helen is meant to be tall and tall. <laughs> Hermia is meant to be tall and tall. And you're sort of, that's it. That is the only information you're given. And as you say, they swap... I mean, they're, they're a construct, aren't they? They're, they're sort of a, and it's so hard. I mean, there's a speech, there's a soliloquy that Helena has. And she's sort of just on stage alone. And I remember doing that night after night and just dreading it every single time. And I would love some context for that. I wish I'd looked that up. Yeah. Um, Emma, you, you mentioned a few times that... 
you seem a little scathing of the idea of Shakespeare being, being taught to younger kids or in the classroom, that he's not so much for the classroom. But what do you think is the best way to take on Shakespeare, to learn Shakespeare, to experience Shakespeare? Um, I'm, I'm not at all against Shakespeare in, in the classroom, actually. Uh, and I think that often... Um, uh, I think there is some amazing work going on in schools about how to teach Shakespeare, and particularly how to teach Shakespeare uh, through more active kind of performance. Um, I do think that sometimes uh, our... Uh, that the sense that you're trying to get to a right answer is, is, is actually quite an unhelpful uh, introduction to Shakespeare. So I think there are some kind of pro problems about that. Um, I mean, <clears throat> it, it's, it, it, there's, there's an obvious point to make, which is that Shakespeare uh, is great in the theatre. I'd, I'd want to sort of, with all, all respect to my colleagues, I'd, I'd want to slightly um, nuance that. I think Shakespeare is sometimes great in the mm. theatre, mm. and sometimes yeah. actually a little bit too long and a little <laughs> bit boring. Mm. Um, and one of the things I feel about um, theatrical productions is that, that we're often too reverential. There's a sense that no lines, no line, you know, no line was hurt in the making of this production, and therefore <laughs> it, it, it's th you know three hours forty minutes, and you're just thinking, uh, I, you know, I, I, I've lost the will, lost the will to live. Yeah. Um, so so I, I would be for a more uh, bracing and a more provocative. Uh, time for Shakespeare in the, in the theatre. The best way, I think, to encounter Shakespeare is if somebody has had the guts to really cut the play so that it goes about one hour, 55 minutes with no interval. <laughs> because I think that gives a sense of an arc and a sweep. It's manageable. Uh, it get, it's got a bit of pace. Uh, that would be, I'm afraid, that would be heretically my, uh, my preferred uh, encounter. I'll have to have a police guard to leave the <laughs> Conway Hall. <laughs> I'm wondering if any of you profoundly disagree with that, because you're I all nodding. Totally dis I totally agree. Absolutely agree. And I also think reading Shakespeare is actually sometimes... I get so much more out of it than watching a performance, because sometimes I want to read a speech three times, um, like great poetry. I, you know, I, d I don't always love watching it be performed, to be honest. If it's I, if I was in it and it was less than two hours, I'm delighted, because it means... You know, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, depending on the play, mm. one hour 55 might be a bit, <laughs> a bit sparing for some of, the, some of them. But, yeah, I, 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 I absolutely agree about, yeah. about being reverential and, and being careful yeah. about cutting lines, and it's, it can be boring sometimes. <laughs> Beforehand, um, <laughs> what about um, film adaptations? Or just in general, would you say there's a particular adaptation that you think is the, this the real best, best one you've seen? or the best one that's made that? Um, I, I think that film adaptations, precisely because they are usually quite selective, they have to make a decision about what they're trying to do, and that's often really revealing it, because it doesn't pretend to be... It's not trying to be the whole play or the definitive play. There's something a little bit more provisional or contingent. So I, I'm a great fan of, uh, of, of Shakespeare films of all sorts, uh, I mean, uh, I, I think that there are some brilliant filmmakers who've made uh, Shakespeare films. I've just been in a, an Orson Welles phase, and I think Welles is a really brilliant critic of Shakespeare. Uh, but, but I uh, had occasion uh, to watch a little bit of Romeo and Juliet uh, the other day. <laughs> and I thought, well, there's, there's, there's something to be said about this, uh, uh, about this film. So... Um, uh, having been very scathing about long productions, I've shown my, myself to be um, uh, rather, rather open-minded about, about adaptations. I'm afraid I'm going to have to... Are you staying to sign a few books, Emma? I think possibly you might be, but um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you all very, very much for coming. Thank you. Uh, thank you so thank much you. for all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations.